Hello, I'm Zainab Badawi. Welcome to the Ivan Franco Theatre in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, for this Intelligence Square debate. Ukraine is, of course, along with Poland, host of the Euro 2012 Football Championships. And you know what? The country is already gearing up for this momentous occasion. But will it be an honour or a burden? Well, that's the subject of our debate. First, let's hear from the Ukrainian government a few words from the Deputy Prime Minister, Boris Kolesnikov. Przalska. Добрый вечер, уважаемые дамы и господа. Я рад вас всех видеть в ходе э, предстоящих дебатов по проведению в нашей стране чемпионата Европы по футболу. Мы имели менее двух лет для того, чтобы создать инфраструктуру, которую наша страна не имела на протяжении всех 20 лет независимости. Мне остается пожелать вам успешных дебатов в меру горячих споров, в которых, как известно, рождается истина. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. Спасибо большое. Вы премьер-министр. Спасибо большое украинскому депутату премьер-министру. So now our debate can begin. Our motion is the hosting of major sports events good for a nation's health. We've got a great panel lined up for you. Two for the motion, two against. Arguing for the motion, Lord Mandelson, the former British Cabinet Minister under the Labour government. Also for the motion, Markian Lubkivsky from UEFA here in Ukraine. And arguing against the motion, we have the former Indian sports minister, Mani Shankar, and also South African social activist, Dipolo Peko. That's our panel. Welcome to you all. All right, without further ado now, let's hear the arguments um, for the motion. Lord Mandelson, former EU Trade Commissioner, of course, very strongly backs London's bid to host the Olympics, which, of course, is happening next year. Lord Mandelson. Well, good evening, everyone, and can I say how great it is to be in Kiev and how pleased I am uh, to be supporting this motion, although uh, I would say at the outset that staging major sports events is not risk-free. Uh, you're going to hear in a moment an Indian uh, account uh, of what can go wrong. Bad planning, poor delivery, too little legacy, some awful publicity. In other words, an expensive public relations disaster, despite the rightful pride that Indian people uh, uh, took, if not their media, uh, at their uh, opening ceremony. But it doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be like India or indeed uh, South Africa. It can be Barcelona. It can be Sydney. It can be Beijing. Uh, or, as I predict, uh, London will be next uh, year. These are venues that have or will have achieved uh, major lasting legacies uh, for their cities and for their countries from hosting these major sporting events. And I believe that Ukraine's international standing uh, and its image and its ability to attract foreign investment in the future will be boosted by hosting Euro 2012. I believe and I'm confident that uh, Ukraine's government and hosting authorities will not get it wrong. They've learned the right lessons they know what is at stake. And let's reflect just what is at stake. As a British and European politician, I've come to know uh, Ukraine and I've come to admire uh, your country. But many haven't in the world, or not yet. Ukraine needs to be put on the map. And I believe that Euro 2012 <coughs> will do this for Ukraine. But that's not all. Euro 2012 will also deliver much-needed investment for this country. In new bridges, roads and other transport networks, uh, rail and air, and other physical infrastructure to make these championships a success, 
not just sports facilities that can be used for, uh, for, for forever by young people and others in this country, but hotel and other uh, accommodation and infrastructure that will be permanent long after Euro 2012 has ended. And if I had to sum up in a word what hosting a major event like this can offer, that word would be catalyst or trigger. Keep one of those words in your mind throughout this debate. There's a lot that needs to happen in Ukraine, a long way to catch up with other developed economies uh, in Europe. Euro 2012 will trigger, it will be the catalyst for a lot of investment that would otherwise take years to happen or wouldn't happen at all. And you'll get something else, huge popular entertainment national pride. So the reason I'm for this motion is because I'm in favour of bothering. I'm in favour of taking on a challenge. I'm in favour of ambition. And yes, I'm also in favour of taking a bit of a risk, because no risk, no reward either. That's how countries like people have grown great. And I think that Ukraine has a big opportunity in Euro 2012, and I think Ukraine should seize that opportunity with both hands. Thank you very much indeed. Lord Manderson, thank you. No ambivalence there in your arguments at all, it Lord Manderson. With me. Oh, yeah, clear cut, <laughs> absolutely. We got the message loud and clear. Okay, well, against the motion is our next speaker, Mani Shankar. And until 2008, he was India's Minister for Sport and Youth Affairs. He's now in the upper chamber of the Indian Parliament. And he was really opposed to Delhi hosting the Commonwealth Games last year. Mani Shankar. Madam Chairperson, may I immediately reject Lord Mandelson's argument that I am against the motion because it doesn't have to be like India. I find that an exceptionally insulting statement to make. And I believe that I am on this side not because I am opposed to sports, nor because I am opposed to sports persons, but because I am opposed to making a business of sports. Ordinary sports events, the events that take place in a village, the events that take place in a university or in a school, I welcome them. But why does it have to become a major business event? Lord Mandelson argues that the best thing about these mega sports events is that they leave a major, major lasting legacies. Why do we have to link infrastructure or investment or urban regeneration or attracting foreign investment or attracting tourism to kicking a ball around a field? These are national tasks. They have to be undertaken in any case. I don't think India waited for the Commonwealth Games to start building roads or to start building railways or to put up airports. If you need airports, build them. If you need flyovers, build them. If you want to build metros, build them. But why link it to a sports event? Indeed, it is only a sensible country like China, which had all this, which had proved that it was an economic miracle. And after it had established itself as a major economic power, and potentially a major political power that it hosted these games. When you're a fading empire like the United Kingdom or a country that hasn't really risen like India, for us to start trying to substitute nation building by becoming hosts of mega sports events is to delude the world and to delude ourselves. We have spent on the Commonwealth Games in Delhi $18 billion. Yes, Delhi needs $18 billion. Delhi, in fact, needs even $80 billion. But what about the rest of the country? What about all those 1 billion people and more who are not going to be beneficiaries 
of whatever is the legacy, if any, of the Commonwealth Games in Delhi. Lord Mandelson says that you need these games to put Ukraine on the map. Ukraine has been on the map since 988. Ukraine has been on the map in such a way that it has been coveted on the east by Russia and on the west by Germany. Ukraine is a country that has suffered enormously because of its place on the map. And to suggest that you cannot get people to be interested in Ukraine if you don't hold a football match here is to underestimate both the intelligence of outsiders and the imagination of the people of Ukraine. There has been massive waste of money in the organization of the mega sports event in India. For never forget that even if there are a few million Indians who are able to speak English and dine with Lord Mandelson knowing how to use a fork and a knife, there are one billion Indians who live on less than 16 UAH a day. And this is the country that decided to project an image of itself on this circus, which was called the Commonwealth Games. Thank you very much. Mani Shankar, thank you very much. Lord Manderson, he did bring your name up a few times. I'll give you the right to reply a little bit later. OK, our third speaker on this motion, the hosting of major sports events is good for a nation's health, is Markian Lubkiski from UEFA here in Ukraine. He's a former Ukrainian diplomat, and he's now on the organizing committee for Euro 2012. Your time starts now for the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, I will immediately attack Mani uh, and his political speech. I hardly can imagine how we can bring millions of guests to our country without roads, stadia, infrastructure, new airports and runaways. Maybe it was your case, but it will not be our. In a year time, we are going to co-host an unprecedented event in our history. Therefore, benefiting from the international experience while getting ready for the tournament is crucial for my country. I will be sincere with you tonight. When I was offered the position of the tournament director for Ukraine, I was very skeptic about Ukraine's capability to host such an important event. And now, after two years, I have realized that I was wrong. Let me tell you what made my, ch my change my might. Championship can't be considered as just a sporting e event of Ukraine, it's very important geopolitical event, I want to stress it. Taking into consideration my diplomatic experience, I can assure you that it plays a crucial role for our country, even at the same time, this is a big challenge, as it was mentioned. As you all perfectly know, Ukraine is a post-Soviet country with a heavy burden of the communist past. Nonetheless, it has been 20 years since we, get, since we have got our independence. This unpleasant burden still keeps on weighing us down. While facing uh, on the, another problem in organizing the tournament, I convince myself that all the difficulties we find in our way have the civilizational ground. And I would like to underline that this is the biggest issue we face here in Ukraine, which is the phenomenon for the post-Soviet so uh, societies. Besides the fact that this is unprecedented event in our history. Moreover, it is the biggest sporting event on the post-Soviet territory since the Olympics in Moscow and Winter Olympics in Sarajevo in Bosnia. And we lack necessary knowledge. The real problem is hidden behind our mentality, the heavily impacted by post-Soviet Marx mentality. In these 20 years, we, will, we still have not managed to achieve the European standards of living, as we lack of the understanding of these standards. Let me be honest with you. Uh, we did not even try seriously to change Soviet standards in many fields. But thanks to UEFA Euro 2012, these improvements and now on, are, no, are now on agenda, and the championship will shortly deliver a leap in quality of life to the Ukrainian citizens. I consider now 
the tournament as an important step in the integration process of our country to the European community. It would be naive to expect that the investments for new airports, roads, runaways, medical establishment, tourist infrastructure and many other essential objects will be allocated by some governmental programs, if not the tournament. I can assure you, as a person who knows the local mentality inside out, that we could wait for changes for another 20 years. We should always feel the responsibility for our image and future. And most importantly, to understand what prospects open the possibility of such grand event. We should be able to fully take advantage of this opportunity. Looking at Euro 2012 prospects for our country from inside, I can assure you that Ukraine will succeed. Ukrainian citizens will be enjoying the priceless legacy of the tournament for many years ahead, recalling this amazing event as a step towards a new, decent life we all deserve. Thank you for your attention. Well, Markian Lubkivsky, thank you very much indeed. And now to make her opening arguments against the motion, please welcome from South Africa, Dipolo Peiko. She's the Policy and Advocacy Director at the think tank Trade Collective. And she was against her country hosting last year's World Cup. You'll have to tell us more, Dipolo. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. The experience of hosting the World Cup for us in South Africa was one which was very ambivalent and one which was very exciting and one which, which was also very um, draining in many respects. One of the things I must say as a rider to my remarks is that we did it really well. There were no disasters, there were no embarrassments, and I think even FIFA, the, the, Federation, uh, the Football Federation, has agreed that it was one of the best um, World Cups to be held in history and also one of the most profitable. Now, where does that leave us? There are three points, social, political, and economic. On a social level, these wonderful trains which were built at the cost of about 52 billion rands, which is just under $800 million US, um, What's the issue there? The issue is that, number one, it didn't bring anybody closer together. These airports which were built, there was nothing particularly wrong with the old airports in the first place. And even though we might argue that these were things that were going to happen anyway, that these were part of a, some kind of a social investment plan, would it have happened so soon? Would it have happened at the cost of 10 years' worth of housing investment, which could have been built with the money that we used at the World Cup? Would it have been at the cost of, for example, the seven, the, 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 the seven seats per stadia, which, which each of which could have actually um, built a school library across the, the, the South African nation. Only 7% of schools in South Africa have a functioning library. So you ask me whether seven bits of plastic were worth the trade-off that we actually have had. Another thing that one has to... Oh, thank you. <laughs> The whole notion around reputation and building national, you know, national pride, it seems as though emerging economies are using sporting events as some kind of a debut onto the world stage. China with the Olympics, India with the, with the Commonwealth Games, and now Ukraine with UEFA 2012. South Africa, of course, as well with the FIFA World Cup. But why is this the most necessary and pertinent way to debut onto the world platform? Now, I also wonder whether it is worth mentioning at this moment that the cost of this does not link with foreign direct investment. I beg to differ with, my, with the previous speakers. Nowhere, not in Germany, not after Beijing, not after Sydney, has it been proven tangibly that a major global sporting event led to, to direct foreign investment and that this investment was anchored in the local economy. Any growth that may have occurred was very short term, was very much linked to a particular season, which was those events. Any employment which was, uh, which was generated was, again, short-term and transient and did not lead into lasting, cascading benefits. For a few weeks in South Africa, the crime rate decreased significantly. That is probably one of the things that most people think about when they think about my country. Uh, the crime rate was almost zero. And then soon after that, it kind of like kind of sort of started spiking up again, back to where we probably most people are familiar with it being. It is not the only defining feature of our country, but it's only but one. However, it, did not, it is not the panacea 
for every social event. It's not the panacea for every social problem. During the event, of course, small businesses, small-scale entrepreneurs, street traders, hawkers, were completely marginalized from the processes. They did not get any of the proceeds. Union busting, on a final note in my last 10 seconds, was also a huge feature of, um, of, of, of some of the, the practices that we see, a lot of bullying from big businesses. Anybody who wanted to make a bit of money who was not in big business was completely marginalized. So I urge you, friends from Ukraine, to think and to think very carefully and to learn the lessons that we have learned very painfully. Thank you. <laughs> Dipolo. Dipolo Peiko, thank you. So there are our opening arguments. They're being very robust here, you know. But it's interesting because you, audience, we actually polled you, as, as you know, when you were coming in before you heard the opening arguments. And we're going to ask you to also vote again at the end of this debate to see if your opinions have changed. And what I find interesting is listening to our four speakers, you are actually applauding the speakers against the motion the hosting of major sports events is good for a nation's health. Let me tell you how you voted. So for the motion, 66%. Against the motion, so you've got a huge advantage there. Against the motion, 20%. And the don't knows are 14%. But I don't know, you might have a lot to play for, you know, because judging by the response you were getting to your comments, you never know, you might find there's a huge sea change moving towards you. So, panellists, you can still sway the votes in here. And um, I'd like to start um, taking some questions from the floor. Please. Uh, I'm Yevgen Pashkovsky, and my question to Mr. Mendelssohn. Yeah? Uh, what do you think, if you come to a Ukrainian and ask him on her a question, what kind of entertainment they want? They want a Euro sport event, or they want a visa-free regime to Schengen or to the UK. What do you think the choice will be? Well, that's an interesting take on our debate. OK, yeah, next uh, question. Mm -hmm. My name is Alexander Etnis. I'm a physician. And my question is to Mr. Markian Lubkivsky. Please uh, think about, is hosting of Euro 12 in Ukraine is a support for development of our healthcare system? Thank you very much. OK, let's start with that one. Markian Lubkivsky, the doctor there, is saying, is the hosting of Euro 2012 um, perhaps a good way of spending your money? What about your healthcare system? You know, uh, the problem is that the, the health care in, in Ukraine and medical care in Ukraine is, is on a very low level. So it's, it, it gives us, I think, unique opportunity to upgrade our, our medical system. You, you can't imagine every day we are in contact with the Ukrainian hospitals, with the Ukrainian, uh, uh, you know, people responsible for, for these issues. and. Uh, it was, it was very hard to us to, to, to choose the hospitals in Kyiv, Kharkiv, Donetsk and Lviv, which are on the European standard level. OK, um, Lord Manderson, there was a, a specific question there about whether Ukrainians want sports or a visa-free regime to visit countries like the UK. To be perfectly frank with you, I think that as far as entertainment goes, there's more entertainment out of football on TV than there is out of a visa-free uh, regime, if you're defining it in terms of entertainment. But my straight answer to you is that I'd like the Ukrainian people to have both those things. And one of the things I want to come out of that friendship and those closer ties between Ukraine and the European Union is, yes, uh, a, a visa-free ability to travel uh, between all these uh, places. It may not come tomorrow, but I think we would make a very good start in putting Ukraine firmly at the heart of Europe by having, the, uh, by having UEFA's games uh, uh, here in Euro 2012. You have to start somewhere, and I think it would be a jolly good start with that. Right, OK, let's take some more questions. OK, ushers, microphones, just give them to anybody, and we'll speak. Gentlemen here, take the microphone. Yep. My, my question is to Mr. Lubkivsky. And uh, 
are your assumptions or assertions that uh, Euro uh, 2012 is very beneficial uh, in terms of investments, etc., are based on some calculations? And if so, when we will, ha uh, when this cost will be recovered, the date? One year, two years, or when? Okay, put your hand up if you have got a question for this side. <laughs> you have, okay, you have, go. Um, it was really briefly mentioned uh, among the speakers that Ukraine is not alone hosting this uh, sports event. And my question is, since we split the responsibility and profits between two countries, what are the implications for that? Okay, thank you. Behind. My question is to many. Should Ukraine have cancelled the event? in your opinion? To actually withdraw from the games, you're asking yeah. Manny should, if should Ukraine should withdraw. Should we have withdrawn with the game? This is a decision for Ukrainians to take and not for Indians to advise you. But this I'll tell you, holding these championships in order to improve the health of your economy is like giving aspirin for a case of AIDS. The answer does not lie in holding a one-off sporting event along with Poland. But you don't want to give him any advice about whether Ukraine could even now cancel uh, I, withdraw? I, 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 I think it would be presumptuous of me to give any advice okay. to Ukraine on what it should do, as I would regard it as somewhat presumptuous okay. for the Ukrainians to tell me whether we should have withdrawn from the games. I think we should have, but then not even Indians listen to me, so why would I expect <laughs> the Ukrainians to do so? <laughs> Lord Mandelson. You know, to be honest, if that's the sort of advice you gave the Indian people, I'm surprised they didn't listen to you, because I think for Ukraine to, ca to withdraw from these games, to cancel their hosting of Euro 2012 would be an absolute disaster for this country. And I'm afraid I am unambiguous about that, and I will say it very forthrightly. What would it say about a country? So I say to you, Ukraine doesn't suffer from AIDS, as you say, and it doesn't therefore need an aspirin. What it does need is a big boost for its economy. Okay. It needs to know that Ukraine is a welcoming people, open for business, ready to bring investment and new jobs and employment to its country, and that's what okay, these money. jobs will, that's what we to do. In the case of India, if my advice had been listened to and we'd withdrawn, we have not been in a situation where from an initial projected expenditure of half a billion dollars, we went up to $18 billion simply because of the false prestige involved. It's this distortion of national values and national okay. priorities Markian, that and I that's, yeah. Markian, and it's related. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, related. It's related. It's related. Mark, I'm coming. It's related yeah, but, to the but, but, question uh, about, based on economic calculations, yeah. whether you recover costs, yeah, but please. I, I want just to, to, to make a very short remark. To, to take uh, the euro from Ukraine is not an issue. It's reality. Ukraine will host in Poland euro in 2012. This is done. Was it a popular decision exactly. when you made the bid? Yeah, for sure. So it was something that the masses backed. You're exactly. sure of yeah, that? I'm sure of that. So, and one more thing to, to, to just to, to, to give a reply to, so the, the total amount of direct costs for UEFA Euro 2012 for Ukraine is only 750 millions of US dollars. And I'm speaking only about two stadia because the rest, I mean, new airports and money, you are absolutely right. This is the obligation of state to construct new airports, but so that's why I'm not counting that. So, uh, well, Di Polo said that in South Africa they built a new airport in Johannesburg that they didn't particularly need. You know, I, okay, I, I, yeah. visited, I, visited, I visited South Africa last year, so I think that uh, Leopoldo is the only unhappy person from South Africa. He liked, the, Africa, airport. He liked the airport, Di Polo. <laughs> Everybody was happy there. <laughs> we may have looked happy for that moment, uh, Marikana, but I mean, the, the, living, the, the reality is that the economy has not benefited in any way from that. And uh, don't mistake, wait, don't mistake euphoria for joy and don't mistake it for success, ultimately. And I think that um, nobody has answered the gentleman with the red tie about the visa. I think that's a very important question because it is linked to belonging. It is linked to a different kind of belonging and, and, and welcomingness. And that's a very critical question. 
What is the marker of belonging that these games tend to bring to nations, to continents? What is the marker of inclusivity? And what is the marker of citizenship, of being part of a larger um, community? If I had the choice personally between easy mobility around the world versus kicking a ball around and watching sporting events that I could watch on DSTV, I think I would go for the easy mobility. But that's just me. OK, well, Lord Manderson did answer that. Let's go to Andrei Shevchenko, a Ukrainian politician here in Kiev who's got a comment to make. I'm from the Ukrainian parliament. And first, I want to support Mr. Lukivsky. Uh, the day when we learned that we would host the, uh, the competition, I think it was one of the happiest moments in uh, our nation's recent history. And I have no doubts that the event itself is going to be wonderful. The question is, what price this country is going to pay for that? It's a country where an average citizen makes about between two and three hundred dollars a month. And it's a country which is notoriously famous for its corruption. Moreover, the government has introduced a spe special procedures for expenses for this competition, cancelling all the tenders for the Euro 2012 contracts. So I think many people in this country have a very simple question. Is it a football competition or is it a competition in corruption opportunities for the Ukrainian authorities and in easy money chances for the Ukrainian oligarchs? And all right, well, you asked the question, what's the question answer? Is, you my know. Question, my question yeah. is to Mr. Mendelssohn and to Mr. Ayer. How would you find this balance between, this, between those corruption risks that we have been talking about and the efficiency of all the preparations, which are hugely important too? Thanks. Markian, I know you say yeah, that you, are, I, I'm, you I'm, represent UEFA here no, in Ukraine. I, I, I can easily answer. You know, Andre is a very good friend of mine, but nevertheless. So the main problem why, why I'm not the lawyer of the government. <laughs> I'm representing UEFA in Ukraine, but Andrei, I, if I'm not mistaken, you were the representative of the former government, which lost a lot of time preparing Euro. You have lost uh, more than two years. What's your answer so about that's the corruption the answer risks? Because we, yeah. I'm speaking about the tender procedure. Okay. So usual tender, tender procedure is like three months. So it is, and in this short, short period of time, it is impossible to construct all, all runaways, all stay there, everything in this country. And you know this quite good. So this is my answer. All right, Peter Manderson, I mean, th well, there I'd are like risks, aren't there? Well, I think it's a great shame that the stadia, the stadiums that were built in South Africa in many cases now, um, are, are, are occupied by squatters. They're not used, they're not enjoyed. And I feel it's a great shame that the poor planning about the legacy of the games in South Africa has resulted uh, in that outcome. But that's not the outcome that, that we've seen in many okay. other uh, countries and cities Let that have hosted Polo. events like this. Let Dipolo pick up. Squatters in your stadiums from the World Cup, briefly. Yeah, yeah. Well, not entirely, but I mean also the cost of maintaining the stadium. It's not only in South Africa. Greece is having the same problems. Um, Beijing is having the same problems. It's the, it's the white elephant syndrome. And it goes to illustrate that if this is not part of an embedded planning process, Process, and rather than being an event, it does lead Why? to this. It, it does to lead be, to these, to these to sort planned. of white elephants. It has so, to be planned. Of but course. I mean, the point is that we are talking as though this is a given, Peter, and it's not. Event after event, Olympic after e Olympic, we seem to be replicating the same kind of poor, Diepolo, the euphoric, first thing I said the euphoric I kind of, you know, this euphoria. It's fun. The first it's entertainment. Said, the first thing I said was it's not risk free. But if you never try anything, if you never take a challenge on, if you always say somebody else can take this opportunity, you might as well not get out of bed in the morning. A hundred billion US dollars of risk. A hundred billion US dollars of risk. I would have rather pass that on. Okay. Some more points? I'm sure that all of Ukrainians here enjoyed your uh, speech about the uh, national aspect of this problem. Uh, you emphasized on that the sport should be separate from business. Uh, what about that uh, people have been investing money in sport for too long in India, in Ukraine? Uh, is it bad to, expert, uh, to expect a return on that? OK. Some more points? Yep, great. Who's got the microphone? Stand up and speak. The first uh, 
question is for the guests who are against uh, the event. What part of the national budget did your country spend on such event for the South Africa? Because I'm a member of the budget committee and we are spending around 60 billion uh, Ukrainian hryvnias, which is around one third of Ukrainian budget. The second thing, uh, I absolutely agree with my colleague, the physician, because uh, we have such a great event, we should have all the doctors running down to Ukraine, servicing all the tourists visiting Ukraine, why they are living in Libya under bombs. Oh, okay. Why are they leaving Ukraine? Why are they staying in Libya? Why are they not returning back? Maybe because their salaries are That's so low. That's all to low. do with Euro 2012? This is exactly all because right. somebody okay. has to serve, somebody has to serve the tourists. Thank you. Okay. I have a question for Leopoldo Pekka. Uh, I really like your speech. It was very emotional. Uh, at the same time, I was a little bit concerned when you talked about the results and uh, what happens after after that. Uh, my question is, do you really think that's true or you make it up just for this debate? Thanks. Thanks that's for it. that. Purple shirt. I'd like to raise a very important question uh, and ask all the guests about it. Is uh, hosting of such kind of event, uh, a European football championship, the best way for sustainable development, for simultaneous, uh, simultaneous development in okay. uh, many spheres, in medicine, in sport, in education, or do we have actually uh, better right. alternatives for okay. such kind Thank you. of development? I Thank can you. get to all of you if you keep your comments. You can make comments, you don't have to ask questions. Very, very short. Okay, who's got the microphone? Yes. Hello, Ms. Lipolo mentioned that attracting private organizations and private investors can help host the, such an event. Do you think for Ukraine it could be a good idea to uh, attract private investors and private organizations to help prepare educationally and maybe help prepare constructions before Euro 2012? Thank okay, you. let's just take some brief comments on those questions. Dipolo, a couple of questions to you. I mean, first of all, um, South Africa more open as a result of the World Cup. My point is open. that South Africa has been, a, uh, has been a tourist destination of choice anyway. Cape Town has, been chill, has always been called one of the coolest cities in the world anyway. Um, and I, I, I slightly take umbrage the suggestion that I may have been sort of spiced up my, my data as well, because I think that all of the information is triangulated and by credible sources. But I think that we cannot take one or two experiences and turn them into normative. Okay. Exceptions do not create rules. Manny, one question. Is it bad to make profits out of sports? Yes. If you're going to invest in a business, then you need to make profits. But are we talking about sports or are we talking about business? My objection is only that if we have mega sports events, why not spread them to the more deprived parts of our countries. We don't do that. We tend to do it in capitals. London, Kiev, Beijing, New Delhi. It's not the villages right. of India that benefit. It's complete rubbish. It's complete rubbish. The, the London Olympics that are being constructed uh, in, for in 2012 next year are drawing on businesses creating jobs, goods, services, commodities, steel, all over the United Kingdom. Do you really think that we could simply deliver the games in London, only using Londoners, only depending on London supplies and London businesses? Of course I'm, we can't. I'm not I've in never a position to comment on London, well, I am in a position but I do know, I do know I that in, in India, all this investment of $18 billion was made in the richest yeah. part of the richest well, he capital knows India, in the country. You know London. Well, that's leave it. right. Let's leave do it the London way right, then, very shall quickly. we? Very quickly. Markian, there was a question about, is this the best way for sustainable development, somebody said? I, I think yes. Briefly. I think Euro is the best catalyst for everything, uh, I mean, in terms of, of construction and infrastructure. I'd like to give only a short remark to Andre. He, he's, he told that government is spending a lot of money, but this is not for the tournament. This is for other development. I think you like to. You so travel, general you, infrastructure. You travel as well. a lot. You travel okay. a lot. You are, you are right. using We're gonna, different airports. I'm just going to take. I think you don't, they didn't like the airport points. in Kiev or in Lviv. Basic comments. Now, no more time for questions. Very quickly, just short comments. 25 seconds. I'm participating in three Olympic Games, two World Championship, and three European Championship in basketball. And I see Barcelona before Olympic Games and after. It's huge different. I say Atlanta before Olympic Games and after. It's huge different. And other cities is other country. Okay. I'm just telling you, I know many doubts, I know many risks, 
people are right in many things. Okay. But I don't think anybody will regret after our event in Kyiv, after Euro 2000. Were you in the Olympics yourself in the basketball team? <laughs> yes, oh, I, right. Olympic champion. Oh, yes. well done. OK. Put the microphone. Who's got the microphone? Yes, briefly. I suppose that the answer to the main question is predetermined by the level of development of the countries, of the host countries. I think that Poland will be much more will get much more benefit from this as Ukraine. It's the okay. syndrome of the richer getting richer and the poor getting poorer. If economy is corrupted, it will get more corrupted. Thank you. Thank you. Who's got the microphone? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so my idea is that Ukraine needs something uh, big that will unite uh, all uh, country, all uh, people. And I think that this event can really make our people be proud of themselves and be proud of a country. And this is one aim that we can reach all together. All right, now, audience, thank you very much. You've listened to the arguments, you've asked some questions. Can you vote again, please? And while you're doing that, our panel are going to make their closing arguments, and this time in reverse order. So, against the motion from South Africa, DiPolo Peco incorporates some of the uh, points you heard in your final arguments. Stay Thank where you're you. sitting. Basically, the we need to weigh up the costs against the benefits, that it's also very important to think about the social developmental platform, which acts as a catalyst for other forms of development and other ways of revitalizing the economy, not only using sporting events as just that event, but as part of a continuum. One has to look at unemployment and, and other issues and wonder whether local producers and local businesses are going to be able to benefit in any way from these events, which we have not really seen in South Africa. What we've seen as small business also to respond to the, the to the young lady who asked me the question about whether um, whether investors can support um, these games they should but we need to follow the dollar and make sure that the dollar stays in the house that it doesn't go out the door um, and that it actually comes back into the coffers of the nation that is the important part um, dollars which and pounds and euros which are kind of flying out the window and not embedded in the local economy are not really that useful to the local context. Okay, thank you. And um, for the motion, Markian Lukivsky, your closing argument. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, South Africa is not, is not our case. India is not our case. Uh, so regarding the, the stadia, so now we put in place uh, operational teams. So we will operate stadia we, now we have already two, two ready stadia in Donetsk and in Kharkiv, and now we are working on construction on the, to, to, to more. So that's why it's not an issue for us. I want to invite everybody to, to come to Ukraine and to feel Euro 2012. Regarding the working place, I, I'd like, I'm very glad to inform that we will in, involve a lot of people who will work for Euro 2012, and now we are, they are working on the construction side. I mean, first of all, stewards for, this, for the stadia, volunteers who will, who will help us a lot. So uh, that's why I'm uh, absolutely confident that it will be a very nice event, very successful, and this is really one life chance. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Closing argument for, against the motion, Mani Shankar from India. I think it's far more important to make India a sporting nation than to make it a nation which is renowned for hosting sports events. 95% of our children have no formal access to organized sports. And yet one finds that the amount of money that is available for projecting a completely false image of a prosperous India is much larger than is available to making it a sporting nation by providing facilities to poor students all around the country. I don't think we should allow the oligarchs of the sports business to take over a game which should be played in every village and in every courtyard. All right, Mani Shankar, thank you. <laughs> Lord Manderson for the motion. Well, the prejudice against uh, the motion is that, you know, we should be against big business, we should be against capitalism, we should be against trade, we should be against uh, uh, oligarchs. Look, I've never said that hosting a major sporting event like this is an economic panacea 
that you don't have to do anything else in a country or for its economy. All you have to do is to host a, a, a sporting event like this and it will be transformed. That, that's, that's ridiculous. But what it will do is give a big, lasting shot in the economic arm of this country. And this, at, the, at Ukraine's stage of development, is what it needs. And last of all, the argument has been made that Ukraine should simply pull out of the games. It should cancel its hosting uh, of, uh, of Euro 2012. That would be like Ukraine saying to the rest of the rest of Europe and to the rest of the world, we're going to turn our back on you. You know, we didn't want you to come here uh, in the first place. We're not good enough to host a games uh, like this. You know, we're closed both for sport and for business. Is that really the sort of message that you want Ukraine to give to the rest of Europe and to the rest of the world? I think it would be the last sort of message right. that Ukraine will want to give, and that's why I think it's important to vote in favour of this motion. Thank you. All right. OK. Audience, I'm going to tell you, remind you again how you voted at the beginning of this debate, before you heard any of the arguments. For the motion, the hosting of major sports events is good for a nation's health. For that motion, supporting it was 66%. Against was 20%. And the don't knows was 14%. You listen to the arguments of our four panellists, and this is how you have now voted. For the motion, 41%. Against the motion, 52%. The don't know, 70, the don't know, 7%. Congratulations to the winners. You turned it around. That was a very dramatic result. Commiseration to the losers. They didn't hear my summing up. That was quite didn't. extraordinary. <laughs> so there you are, completely turned. You <laughs> brought them over. Amazing, amazing. I've never known such a result. OK, well, thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to you, our audience, here in the Ivan Franco Theatre Hall in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. To you at home or wherever you are watching. And a special thank you to the Foundation for Effective Governance for making this debate possible. It's a non-profit, non-political organisation that tries to promote public policy here in the Ukraine. From me, Zainab Badawi, goodbye from Kiev. Goodbye. <laughs>